Greetings everyone and welcome to Back to Ashes, my name is Phoenix. If this is your first time here and you begin to like what you are hearing, please join us by hitting that subscribe button and make sure that your notification bell is set to all, that way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel, that information can be found down below. Without further ado, it is now time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Sketchy Plights. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. First of all, my English is not the first language, so please bear with me. For context, I live on the third floor of my apartment complex, which is immediately beside a small local private elementary school to the point I can see their playground from my window since mine is the last apartment of the hallway, and I have been disturbed by their noise during recess. Now on to the story. It first started when I was watching Long Legs a few weeks ago with my boyfriend, who was sleeping over at the time. And if you've seen this movie, you know it involves kids, especially girls. And during the movie, we heard this very quick, high-pitched scream that sounded like a little girl. We stopped the movie pretty troubled since we both heard the scream, and it didn't feel like it came from the direction of the laptop, which made us think if we should call the cops in case there was an actual little girl in need of help nearby. But in my block, there are no other houses or residential buildings, so we don't know how to make it make sense. So we just kept watching the movie, and only the next day we remembered about the school by my building. And ever since that, every night, between 12 a.m. and 1 a.m., I hear the same female childish scream that lasts for about a second. Last night, my boyfriend slept over again, and we both heard the scream again, and I confirmed it with him. Did you hear that? To which he said yes. And I just heard it again as I'm writing this. I swear to God this is true, and sometimes I can just brush it off and go to sleep, but some days I get genuinely terrified. Should I be scared? Should I do anything? Check with my neighbors if they've heard something like this? Talk to the school? Or just try to keep my cool and go back to sleep? What would you do? I was maybe eight, which would make my sister 12. My brother wasn't born yet, and I'm nine years older than him so had to be before then. Our parents went out for their anniversary dinner, which meant they'd be out till at least midnight. My sister was very responsible and capable in babysitting me. I didn't find out till years later, but apparently my parents warned my sister that our grandma, my dad's mom, was manic depressive, which is old-timey talk for bipolar. They told her she was mad at my dad for holding some boundary with her and to not let her in or even respond to her if she came by the house. Of course, none of this was communicated with me. How could you tell an eight-year-old something like that? Anyway, a couple of hours into the evening, we hear a knock on the door. My sister immediately shushes me and holds her finger over her lips. Robbie, I know you're in there. Robbie, come open the door. I remember it like it was yesterday. I could tell it was my grandma, but I could also tell that something just wasn't right. My sister moved us to the hallway where we sat quietly out of sight of any windows. Grandma kept pounding on the door, demanding my dad let her in. Then it goes quiet for a while. I start to relax a bit. Of course, that doesn't last long. Suddenly, a bedroom door starts getting slammed and my grandma sounds like a fucking demon screaming for my dad. 
I've never heard such anger since. She moves across the whole house, pounding on every window. If she wasn't so old, she would surely have broken a window with the absolute fury she was executing. Then it goes quiet again. But now I know better than to relax. We are just huddled together in the hallway in complete silence. I'm shaking like a leaf and so is my sister. This grandma had played games with my sister to hurt my parents in the past, such as taking her to the mall and going to the register with some jewelry and then saying never mind or buying the same jewelry for our cousin. Seriously twisted shit. As I'm typing this, I'm thinking, I need to talk to my therapist about it now. So it's been quiet for a while, and out of nowhere, we hear Grandma putting on this sweet, sweet voice and directly addressing us and trying to coax us with candy to open the door. She also has a shit ton of candy around since she was also a diabetic in serious denial. This was the most surreal experience as she had just sounded like Satan himself and now she sounded like a sweet old granny again. She almost got me. Thankfully, my sister was also wise beyond her years and held me tightly. Finally, it's quiet for about an hour, and my sister said it's time for bed. My bedroom faced the backyard, which had a pool and a high wall, beyond which was a vast empty field with an old railroad track through it. I was used to hearing coyotes, foxes, and other animals outside. Right as I was winding down to fall asleep, the absolute loudest scratching on my window started, as if fucking Freddy Krueger himself was trying to haunt my dreams. I could see the silhouette of my grandma in the moonlight, as it was a full moon that night. I haven't thought about this in years, and my hair is standing at full attention on my neck as I'm typing this. Holy shit. No other windows got scratched that night. Just mine. Then... It was over. I woke up the next day and my sister was telling our parents all about it. I couldn't even be in the room while it was being discussed. A few weeks later, she died from an E. coli infection. She died like Elvis, on the toilet. At her viewing, they put on one of her classic flowy blouses and there was a breeze that lifted it up a bit, causing one of my cousins to shout, She's alive! and run away. After the funeral, I told my mom and dad that I was glad she was gone, and according to my mom, I said, Grandma really stressed me out. She later told me that no child of my age at the time should have to say their grandma stresses them out. Oh, Mom, she did more than stress me out. She terrified me more than any horror film or scary story or freaky night in the woods ever could. And I had plenty of those with my dad, who was an absolute wild mountain man. Both of my parents are gone now, and I wished I would have told them about my experience that night. But I trust that my sister told them what they needed to know. Now I have a four-year-old daughter, and my wife's parents are the complete opposite of my grandparents. Both sides of my family had seriously fucked up histories. It makes me cry when I look at pictures of her with my grandma and grandpa at their farm, riding a horse or chasing a chicken. I'm glad she gets to have the classic grandparent experience. Yeah, I'm definitely going to be talking to my therapist about this. P.S. I don't want anyone to think that I believe mental illness equals more violence. My wife and I both work in mental health, and despite my personal experiences with my psycho granny, I don't project that onto anyone else who suffers from mental illness. It manifests so many ways, the vast majority of which are not violent. In fact, mentally ill people are far more likely to be the victims of violence than perpetrators. When I was around nine, I lived in a strange house with my mom, grandma, and small dog. I wrote about a strange happening there. 
My family and I were night owls and often stayed up until early hours into the morning. On this particular weekend, it was around two in the morning when we heard a loud pounding on the living room door. We were taken aback because of the time, but cautiously opened the wooden door, but not the iron door to peek out. There on the porch stood a disheveled pretty young girl wearing a white jacket. She was looking around fearfully and was out of breath. Once she saw we had opened the front door, she pleaded for us to let her in so she could use our phone. She explained she had jumped from her abusive boyfriend's car and had ran to our house. Now, during this time, there were quite a few bait robberies and assaults that had taken place, so we weren't about to let anyone we didn't know in, but told her to wait there and we would call the police for her. She agreed and sat on the steps. We opened the door wider to watch her as my mom called the police. The operator stayed on the phone with my mom and agreed with our decision to not let her in, but asked her to remain on the porch until help arrived. Suddenly, we heard her scream as she jumped up from the porch steps and headed to our door. We heard the sound of an engine. A red car drove by slowly watching her, my mom, and I and drove off. She said it was her boyfriend. The car turned around and came back the opposite way and drove by very slowly again. The young woman was shivering, but we told her the cops were already on the way and the operator was still on the phone. The car came by a third time and parked across the street. Her boyfriend rode down the window and yelled, Get your ass back in this car, bitch! The young woman screamed back, No! At this point, we were resolved to let her in and open the iron door. Just before she could enter, we heard the comforting sound of police sirens approaching. Her boyfriend sped off and turned the corner quickly. The police pulled up and we all felt relieved. They came up and took her statement. It took about 20 minutes and then they took her away in the police car. We don't know what happened to her after that. We never even learned her name, as she didn't offer it, and we didn't ask as we were all nervous and scared. I think about her from time to time and hope they arrested her boyfriend and that she stayed far, far away from him as he was a piece of shit. A few years ago, it was like fall, early winter of 2019, we were staying with my husband's father. We rented and moved into a house a couple of months later, but had been staying there less than a week at the time this happened. I slept in the living room on an air mattress with our kids, ages 10, 5, and 1. The kitchen, dining room, and living room were all open space. There was a wide counter and sink. That was a bar in the living room side. He never had stools or used it like that, though. Always had a sofa pushed right up to it and had storage for dishes and whenever in the kitchen side. On each end of the counter, there was about four or five feet of open space between that and the wall. Along the wall, directly opposite the front door, there were three doors. Father-in-law's bedroom, bathroom, spare room from left to right. My husband slept on a tiny spare bed. His dad kept the door to his room closed and usually had a TV and, depending on the weather, either a space heater or window AC unit or at least one fan going. I don't remember if my husband had the door to the room he was sleeping in open or closed that night. Except for that back wall where the bedrooms and bathroom were, the house had windows all around it. Large floor-to-ceiling windows along the front and a line of large sliding windows along each wall. It was originally built as a sort of camping gateway cabin. Windows equals view. Apparently, he disagreed and was in the process of building a front porch and replacing about half of these windows with wall. 
Apparently, at the time, the porch was still being built and none of the windows had been taken out yet. This particular night, I was holding my 18-month-old with a child on each side of us. We had all been asleep for a while when I woke up. I'm not quite sure what time it was, but the house was mostly quiet and no one else was awake. I lay there quietly without moving around for a little while and couldn't figure out why I was still awake, much less so alert. Not long after I decided it was just one of those things, sleep cycles, blah, 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 and was about to try to go back to sleep, someone knocked on the front door. Not a loud, banging, beating knock, but definitely a knock. The air mattress was in the middle of the living room area, and the knock was on the kitchen side of that divided counter. I really didn't want to answer the door for multiple reasons. I was in the middle of three sleeping children. It was late, it was cold, and we were cozy and warm all snuggled together. It wasn't my house or company, and no one else seemed to notice someone was knocking. The knocking went on for longer than I would have knocked on someone's door in the middle of the night, and did not get more persistent, though never did turn into banging. No one called out for somebody to answer the door, and no one's cell rang. Finally, I heard someone walking down the unfinished porch. They had stacked some boards and tools and stuff against the front of the house. I heard no clatters or thumps or anything like that, but it did sound like whoever was out there was having to walk on and around those building materials. And then I heard a distinct and firm tapping on the window closest to the kids and me. There was a small, older TV and a small stereo with speakers sitting on two small tables, about nightstand size, actually. The one holding the TV was an old nightstand I had given him years before, between the air mattress and the windows. I was facing away from the window, but the tapping was right there where our heads were. An entire wall of floor to ceiling windows and the tapping was done only in the area that would have been in my direct line of sight if I hadn't been facing the other direction. I don't think I took a single breath until it stopped, and I heard footsteps walking away, and if they walked across ten, all the way to the end of the porch where the driveway was. Walking across the sheets of ten made a pretty distinct sound, I know exactly what it sounds like when someone walks on 10. What I did not realize until the next morning was that the only sheets of 10 out there were already in place because they had finished putting it up as a roof over the porch before stopping for the evening, which meant that there were no sheets of 10 stored against the wall under the windows with those boards and tools and whatever else that was there. The only way for someone or something to have walked across those sheets of tin, which I am certain beyond the shadow of a doubt that I heard happening after hearing an unknown someone knock and tap for so long, it became unsettling rather than annoying, would have been for them to jump and swing up onto the top of the house or porch from an incomplete porch floor and then jump back down at the end. It scares me in a way nothing else ever has and still does every single time I accidentally think about it. And that's why I'm typing this right now and probably also why an owl chose just now to let loose the most terrifying, un-owl-like sound before transitioning into its usual eerie owl sounds. Almost five years ago, me and my best friend did a sleepover party at my house. As usual, the sleepover is about eating home-cooked meals that I prepare. Yep drink and sometimes invite some boys over. That time in particular, we were in the mood for scary movies. So, in the late afternoon, we watched The Conjuring. 
We got very scared about the hide and clap game in the movie. Spoilers ahead, by the way. In the movie, they are in this haunted house playing this game where the kid blindfolded himself and tried to find his sister around the house, only relating to his hearing and his sister has to clap her hands, kind of revealing where she's hidden. It's a very tense scene because you know something scary as shit is about to happen. In fact, at some point, the demon clapped her hands, leading the kids to the basement. End of the spoilers. After seeing that scene, we paused the movie. We looked at each other, hands in hands, and promised that whatever happens, if any of us two would use this to prank the other at any point in our life, that person is a bitch and our friendship would end there. We were very, very serious about it too. My house, it's already pretty scary and many things happened that left us this unsettling feeling of being alone in my house. So a prank of this nature would leave us scarred as fuck forever. We both promised and the party went on. After dinner, my friend got lucky and one of her situation ships at the time joined our party. It's something normal for us, as I said previously, to invite some guests. We all had a pretty fun evening. I got to know him. We listened to music and shared some songs. When it got late, my best friend decided she had enough alcohol and went to the room I gave her for the night, bringing her boy with her. As usual, I stayed up further. I sleep very late. And I started tidying up around the living room. I stopped the music, closed the windows, clap, clap. My eyes were wide open. After processing the sound for a second. I started laughing. What the fuck? You are such a bitch. You say, promise, promise, and then you pull this shit? <laughs> fuck you. I walked to the corridor next to my living room where I thought she would hide herself to mess with me. No one was there. Everything was silent. I expected to find her or at least hear the giggles but there was no sound. I walked up to her room's door at the end of the corridor and everything was silent inside. In this situation, I didn't open the door. I wouldn't want to interrupt something and said to myself that maybe that sound came from spanking or some nasty stuff, who knows. I scrolled off this unsettling feeling and finished shutting up and went to bed. The next morning, I met my friend in the kitchen for breakfast. I confronted her lighthearted. Oh, you nasty. I heard that clapping. That scared the shit out of me. Next time, try not to get spanked so hard after scary movie, please. She looked at me very confused and also preoccupied, telling me that she didn't do anything that involved clapping noises. So, I explained to her further, trying to understand with her what could have made that sound and also to understand in what moment in time it exactly happened. She wasn't the cause of it. It was like a very neat clap-clap, like in the movie. Nothing else could have really made it, if not two hands. Like, nothing that could have fallen or the wind or something can make that sound. We didn't find any explanation for it. I wasn't drunk enough to be inviting sounds. She wasn't lying. I could tell because she immediately got shivers from the thing I was telling her. We still don't know what happened that night. It was a hot summer day. I had gone for a hike and got seriously lost, which is another story in its own. Suffice it to say that I had hiked through trackless wilderness for mile after mile, and even when I found a road, I was so far from a car I didn't know which direction to go. Dead tired, exhausted, and still several miles back to my own car. 
Finally, I was on the way home late afternoon on a hot, sunny summer day, after many hours lost in the mountains and woods. It was about 15 miles to home, and I live out in the country. As I started into the drive, I saw an overweight, out-of-shape fella hitchhiking in the direction I was going. I saw that he had a long, hard walk in front of him, just like I had just completed only 20 minutes ago. Of course, I felt sorry for the fella having a similar ordeal as I just had, and so I stopped and motioned for him to get in. I did not realize my ordeals for the day were not over just yet. As he opened the door, he gave me a look and we exchanged a greeting as he squeezed into the front seat. He was going to a spot on the highway, to my house, and away we went, engaging in light conversation. I glanced down at his side. I noticed he had a prosthetic arm made of a hard, heavy ballistic plastic with a metal hook for grasping instead of a hand. From the conversation, he was an out-of-work construction heavy equipment operator whose house was undergoing a bank foreclosure. He was basically squatting illegally on his own property, probably hitching around during the day to avoid the sheriff evicting him and coming back in the evening to let himself into his basement. So basically a homeless vagrant and a transient that still had a physical address. This didn't raise any red flags with me at the time, though maybe it should have. I have a repertoire of interesting stories I like to tell. I dusted one off and told him a yarn or two to pass the miles and be friendly as it makes the ride easier. He listened politely and I felt he liked to talk a little bit himself. My tales must have encouraged him because he began to tell me a very strange tale of his own. He began to relate to me that years ago, during what he claimed was one of the worst blizzards of the century, in his words, a woman had a bad accident on the U.S. route that went past his house. He said that she was badly injured from the accident and bleeding to death. His story continued and he mentioned that the weather was so bad that the road was undrivable, but as a construction operator, he had a backhoe. He said he loaded the injured woman into the bucket of the backhoe and drove her 30 miles through the freezing cold and blizzard to a major medical center and delivered her to the ER. That was a pretty odd tale, I thought. I am pretty street smart having seen a lot of the world and some of the more dangerous places in it. I believe that he had changed up the story somewhat to protect the guilty. He wanted to share his story but disguised the role or what had really happened. In other words, his story contained a kernel of truth, but he had changed a few details. I am quick to spot inconsistencies and also can analyze just as quickly. It comes with the street smarts. Another word for the survival instincts. What I think is true was that a woman who was fatally injured, perhaps someone who had come to his door for help, I think that she died, and I think he used the bucket loader to bury the body. The why and wherefore, I could not guess at, but I immediately had gotten that impression. I did not have much time to think about it as the drive was coming to an end. It may seem weird to you that I came to that conclusion, but perhaps what follows will convince you. As he ended his story, we had come to the turn for his house. As I turned into the long driveway, he had just ended his story and now began to make improper propositions to me as to what he would like to have happen, amoriously. I was a bit taken aback, but just simply told him politely that that was not my thing and ended my conversation as we pulled up to his house and he continued to insist. The problem was that he was not taking no as an answer. I realized things were rapidly getting out of hand, but I am a cool customer when dealing with actual stress and danger. I am pretty hardcore with discourages. 
most potential male factors, but not this guy, which shows just how dangerous he was. He wasn't getting out of the car now that we were stopped and he had his hard plastic arm, solid and heavy, as a log raised halfway between us, looking me straight in the eye and not saying anything. Having studied self-defense, I knew the deal. If I looked away or blinked, he would knock me out with his arm. He was formidable as well. He may have been fat, but he was a construction worker with large arms and muscles from a life of heavy work. The weight was all to his advantage in any struggle. I knew the deal though, and I always had a plan in case a hitchhiker proved to be dangerous. I had my seatbelt on, and he didn't. The plan was to floor the car into his house at about 60 and put him through the windshield, even if I was injured or unconscious myself. Hopefully, he would be worse. The idea was that the noise of a high-speed crash would bring neighbors to find out what had happened and would also blare the horn. But I could see that he went through the trouble on knocking me out for the purpose of a sexual assault that likely I would never wake up again. Someone this dangerous was not going to leave a witness that could put him in jail for the rest of his life. Likely he was a career criminal, and this was not his first rodeo. The other secret learned from martial arts is never look away and hold the gaze. Read the intent and spontaneously block or deflect the initial attack. This guy could see from my eyes that he would have a real fight on his hands and that I was fully ready for a life or death combat. The situation ended when he opened the door and anticlimactically got out. I quickly backed out of the dooryard and spun the car around, giving him a departing glance and headed out. Phew. I thought, that is the most dangerous motherfucker that I have ever encountered. I really should call the state police and tell them to keep an eye on that scary son of a bitch, but it would only be a matter of time before he tries to kill somebody and at least have a warning about him on their files. But, I thought, the police often don't take me seriously and he didn't do anything other than pose a threat. No actual assault? What can I do? The real reason was now that the situation was over. I just wanted to forget about it. It has been a very long day after all. A police report would take up another hour of my dinner time, and I would have to deal with possibly skeptical or unhelpful authorities. In 2020 retrospect, I see now that that was a mistake. About 10 years later, the property was the site of a very active crime scene. A woman from a nearby state had come to live at that house and had gone missing. I did not realize that his house was the site till I drove by one day and saw a state police crime scene bus, about five cruisers, and a police helicopter, and everything marked off with crime tape. And then I thought, oh my... I really should have let someone know. It might have prevented this, and I was lazy and concerned more with myself that day. The girl's body was later found in a local pond in a freezer that had come from that house. Dark stories of a couple exploiting a young homeless girl down on her luck emerged, and it seems other folks were involved as well. A sordid tale I won't go into here out of respect in case her family were to read this story. I drive by a couple days later and the investigation was winding down and only a cruiser or two were maintaining security. That is when I decided to call into the state police with the story about the that Captain Hook had told me. The next day the crime scene was abuzz again. I suspect they were searching for other cadavers. Although the couple were never charged, they both remain in prison on other charges, the last I knew. The lesson for me was see something, say something. Oh, and hitchhikers these days are getting too damn sketchy.
This happened when I was 19. I'm in my late 30s now. I worked at an old-fashioned local diner in my city as a waitress. The job was fun and the diner was really cute and had multiple locations. It had a bar area and a jukebox. We sold breakfast and lunch items and stayed open 24-7. I worked the day shift with the manager and usually one other waitress. The manager doubled as the short order fry cook. We had a few regulars that came in on certain days at the same time. They were older guys that shamelessly hit on us and made crude jokes. They especially thought I was attractive as I was young and put a lot of work into my physical appearance. One day, at around two hours before my shift ended, a tall gentleman walked in and took a seat at the bar area. I greeted him, gave him a cup of water, and set a menu before him, which was customary. I told him to call me over whenever he was ready to order. He said nothing and just stared at me smiling. I asked if he heard me. Still, nothing. Just staring at me and smiling at me. I walked away and his eyes followed me everywhere. He hadn't touched the water or opened the menu. I approached him again and asked, did he want to order anything? He just smiled and told me his name was Anthony. I said, okay, Anthony, are you going to order anything? Because frankly, his staring and smiling was making me very uncomfortable. He stood up and said to me, I'm going to marry you, and walked out. It was the what the fuck kind of moment. But the last hour and a half of my shift picked up and I kind of forgot about it. On my next shift, Anthony showed up again and sat at the same stool. I brought him another cup of water, but didn't bother with the menu. He started his creepy staring and smiling again. I asked was he going to order something or just stare. He just kept staring at me and smiling creepily. I told my manager that he was creeping me out, and she told him if he wasn't going to order, he needed to leave. He got up and walked to the door. Before exiting, he told me, You're going to be my wife. I went on with my shift and felt weirded out. The next day, Anthony showed up but didn't come in. As I was sweeping the dining area, I noticed him staring at me through the windows and the double doors. When our eyes met, he smiled and ran off. I won't lie, I was pretty damn nervous. After that, I had two days off and put it out of my mind. On my next shift, it was early and the old guys were there with their normal inappropriate conversations. This was during the time when Kanye dropped Gold Digger and surprisingly they knew the song. Anthony walked in and took his normal seat at the bar. I ignored him and filled the coffee cups of the old guys. As I was doing this, they started joking that a girl like me was the type of woman mentioned in Kanye's song, that I would never date a broke man, and that I looked high maintenance. Well, this angered Anthony because he suddenly slammed hard on the counter and screamed at me that I was a money-hungry bitch. He said he hated bitches like me. Everyone was quiet and still. You could hear a pin drop in the restaurant. My heart was racing. I screamed for him to get out now. He stormed to the door and screamed back, Bitch, I'm going to kill you, before running out the door. Well, little 19-year-old me was literally shaking like a leaf in the wind. My heart was pounding and I couldn't concentrate or think. My manager told me to take a breather in the storage room. I did and called the non-emergency police number. I spoke to a kind lady cop who took my statement and Anthony's description down. They sent a cop to look for him, but he was gone. I told my family what happened and every day a different relative sat at my job after breakfast or lunch until I got off work. It was really sweet and I felt a lot safer with them there. About two weeks after that incident, the lady cop called me and told me Anthony had been arrested on drug charges, and because he fit the description, 
I had given, and surprisingly, he had given me his real first name. They knew it was the same guy. He also confessed to stalking and threatening me. He said I no longer needed to worry as he was going away for a while. I thanked her for calling me. Fast forward a few years later. I started working at the same diner part-time between college classes. I was sweeping the dining area when Anthony walked in. For a minute, my heart literally stopped. The same fear I felt at 19 creeped back in and I couldn't make my legs or mouth move. To my surprise, he instantly apologized to me. He said he was very and really sorry about how he acted back then and that he was high on drugs and totally messed up. He hoped I could forgive him. I was pleasantly surprised. I told him he was forgiven. I never saw him again. Unfortunately, all the diners closed down, the last one during the pandemic. The story in and of itself might not be very scary for some, but what made it unsettling for me is the context around it. So, I will start with that. It was a few years back. I was 21 at the time. The story happened in France. I lived in a gender Mary with my mother and father during my master's degree study, and no one else. We didn't have any pets either. A gender Mary's is a sort of police station, but for military police, and generally serve the same purpose, but for smaller towns and cities. Since my father used to work there, we had a service flag given to my father so we can live with him at work. I lived there for about 11 years at this point. It's a nice, quiet little city, and there is some wildlife on the edges of the city, but nothing too crazy. Maybe some wild boars, a few snakes and foxes, but that's about it. However, in the center of the city, where I'd live, there would never be anything like that. The apartment I lived in was on the sixth floor. The door that led to it was very bulky, and if you let go of the door, it would lock on you automatically. All the windows in the house had double glazing for noise isolation, since we lived right next to the highway. So, if you'd close the windows, you wouldn't hear anything except for muffled traffic horns at times. Now, for the story itself. I cannot remember the exact month since I shrugged off the story later on. All I can tell is that it was summertime as we left the windows open at night in the summer to cool down the apartment. We did not have AC at the time. I would wake up very late at night, or early in the morning depending on how you look at it, at around 2 a.m. by a loud banging on my bedroom door. I always kept it locked at night because I like my privacy and my mother has an unhealthy habit of snooping around. I obviously got startled and woke up on the nerves because while it happened that my father or mother would wake me up at night for urgent matters, they would usually knock as well as call out my name and not bang. However, this definitely sounded more like banging and there was no voice calling out to me. I would make for an uninteresting horror protagonist since I figured that whatever is out there, I'm safer in my locked room than going out. I was scared that whatever was out there would hurt my parents and thought to myself that if I hurt my parents in distress, I'd take up my courage and help them. The banging stopped eventually as I listened carefully and there was nothing. I could even hear my mother snoring in her bedroom, so I figured that it was safe to check after five to ten minutes. I take a TV remote to my cell phone with me just to make myself feel more armed and with the flashlight on my phone, I investigate every room. There seems to be no sign of intrusion, stolen goods, or broken stuff anywhere, and since both of my parents were still asleep, 
I figured that it might have been strong gusts of wind hitting my door, or at least that's what I rolled with, because I needed to reassure myself I still felt odd that none of my parents woke up from how loud it was. Although our windows were closed at the time, so it's more of denial than it is an explanation. I went back to bed, locking my door once more and snoozing once my nerves calmed down. I woke up, not even an hour later, to the sounds of screaming. It sounded like a woman was being murdered. I was terrified, shivering in my bed, covers held tight against me. It was loud, yet so distant. You could hear it echo, so it was outside for sure, but it meant that whatever was screaming was louder than a truck horn. It sounded mostly like a woman, but it was very intimidating. Not like someone screaming for help, but rather out of anger. It also had that uncanny valley of, it sounds human, but it's not human. And it also had a sort of breathiness to it, like it was panting between the screams. It kept on going for a solid ten minutes as I cowered in my bed my mind making thoughts as much darker than what was probably the truth. I stayed up for probably half an hour, my heart beating in my chest as I slowly relaxed to the sound of silence at that point. I was so exhausted I ended up passing out. I woke up the next morning at 10, which is not unusual for me, and the first thing I did was ask my parents, at first, I asked them if they could hear any cats fighting last night, thinking that maybe I got the spooks from something that mundane. They told me they did not and asked me why. I explained to them the whole thing and precise that it was almost like a woman screaming for help, and I was shocked that none of them heard that with how impossibly loud it was. They kept dismissing it. And it was as if it was weird of me to keep asking to make sure they didn't hear anything that was remotely close to what I could have heard. Nothing. We went on about our days. I was still puzzled, but I tried to think that maybe it was just an animal or something, but I'm still sure there are no critters you could encounter at night in our little urban city that could have made that much noise and the fact that nobody other than me seemed to have heard it. It was making me uneasy because I am sure that I did not dream any of that. The only explanations I could rationalize with would be the wind for my door, even if I don't understand how wind could have entered my apartment that night, as the intrusion scenario is near to impossible in my mind. And for the screaming, maybe it was a lynx? We have those in France, even if they are rare and even rarer when I used to live there. Although, those two rational explanations just don't fit entirely in my heart, and I suppose I'll never know what happened that night. Okay, so I've never really posted my stories, mostly just reading others, so please excuse me if I do or say anything that isn't common courtesy. In around 2018 or 2019, I was living in Nebraska, where I grew up. I lived in the largest city in Nebraska, but it was still essentially surrounded by corn and wheat fields. The city was expanding, so rich folks started building huge houses with giant properties on the edge of town as things proceeded to grow. All of that said, I had a good friend whose parents' house was one of those big ones right on the blurring line between the fields and the city. My friends and I were constantly hanging out at his place because it was fun. They had tons of property to ride 4 by 4s on, a hot tub, a huge living room for us to watch sports and have reality TV binge sessions, etc., 
Plus, his parents were super cool, and we could drink out there as long as we stayed at the house. It was tons of fun, even though I was or am quite scared of the dark. So, I would just go outside after a certain time because there was little lighting and the nearest neighbor was about a mile away. I always felt a weird energy driving to or from his place if it was late at night, but never had anything happen until late one night. The drive out there was a long winding two-way road that had thick trees on both sides and you pass one of the city's largest cemeteries on the way. Barely any lighting, of course, besides the street lamps every once in a while, and very little traffic. It's all inherently a bit creepy, and I'll admit to having sped through the section of the road many times to get through it as quickly as possible. This specific night was perfect spring weather, so I was driving with my windows down, listening to music, and it was about 10 p.m. I was coming around one of the curves in the road when I had the essential slam my brakes on. Right in front of me, in the middle of the road, maybe 50 yards away, was what looked like a family. Again, Picture a completely pitch black road with thick forest on both sides and only my headlights to show what's in front of me. This was a family of three, maybe four. A tall, slim woman, an average height and weight man, a son, short brown hair but couldn't tell the gender based on the clothing and couldn't see their face, maybe around eight years old, and the mother was pushing a fucking stroller. Their clothes looked normal, not tattered, but not nice. They also were not carrying any kind of light source, meaning before I arrived behind them in my car, they had been walking in the pitch black. They were all facing away from me, walking completely silent in the middle of the street, the same direction I was heading. I had turned my music down to hear if they were speaking. I had music playing, etc. They didn't. The hairs on my arms immediately stood up. I came to a stop in the road behind them, obviously, and just sat there for a moment to let them move. They seemed to be completely unaffected by me and didn't even turn their heads slightly, nor did they attempt to move out of the way. I literally thought I was going insane or that I was dreaming. It was so surreal. Before I really had time to fully process and register what I was seeing and how truly strange it was, they all, at the same time, stopped walking and very slowly turned to face my car. This scared the absolute shit out of me. I honestly didn't give myself enough time to look at their faces as they turned. I immediately threw my car in reverse and sent it backwards for probably a full 20 seconds before flipping a U-turn, nearly running myself off the road and booking it in the other direction. The only thing I remember noticing is that the stroller looked to be completely empty. This was the part that sticks in my mind the most. I've never felt terror like that in my life. I checked my rearview mirror probably a thousand times before getting to a main road and never saw a glimpse of them again. In fact, I never saw a glimpse of them ever, ever again. I tried asking my friend and his family about it, only to essentially feel like I was insane because of the way they looked at me. Every time I tell this story, I get one of three reactions. They immediately think I'm fucking cuckoo, think I'm lying, or have had something sort of similar happen to them. I really don't fucking care if no one believes me, honestly. It was, and still is, the creepiest thing to ever happen to me. I think about it all the time. It was either some weird-ass family trying to scare the shit out of someone, a distraction for an attempted robbery, assault, etc., 
before, it was something more sinister. I'm going to tell myself for probably the rest of my life that it was the first option. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true sketchy plights. Before I go on any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chris Yelius, Anita V, Donna, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S, Tina Mead, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Amy Klimko, and Haunted. Thank you all for remaining the pillars of this channel, as I always say. And of course, from the bottom of my heart, thank you, thank you, thank you for your continued support. I can't say it enough. To the other subscribers and maybe new listeners and new joiners, thank you so much for your support, because without you, I would not have a voice and BTA would never exist. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night. Peace, love, and light to you all.